Oops. And now we're going to have Dr. Deborah and Chambers. Yes, I already have said so. Let me remind you then. <laughs> Dr. Deborah Ann Chamber is a counseling psychologist who currently works at the University of the West Indies Health Center. And so she's therefore looking at our adolescents and young adults who have come from some of these same environments. Dr. Chambers. Thank you. Thank you. So um, I'm going to take a, a bit of liberty because you might have noticed that the title of the presentation really was about um, psychiatry and I think psychology's um, stubborn history with trauma. But um, as I started going into some reflection, and I'll tell you about that, uh, the title that popped up in my head really is this one, Freedom is a Constant Struggle. And I appropriated it from Angela Davis who uh, wrote of her work and the work of freedom fighters all the way from Ferguson to Palestine. And I thought that much of that reflection has to do with um, our work in Jamaica. So um, who am I? And um, what is it that I'm gonna be doing with you today? Um, firstly, yes, I'm a counseling psychologist. Um, my interests are in liberation psychologies. And the idea of liberation psychologies is that we cannot unlink people from their social context, and that for far too often, psychology has been ahistorical and acontextual, and that some of the critique of, of even psychiatry when it comes to trauma is not fully understanding the social context out of which people emerge. And furthermore, the systems um, don't recognize diagnoses, for example, um, such as complex trauma, but sort of try to, to shelve it and minute it into something like PTSD, which although very important, does not really capture our reality. So I uh, very much lean onto the liberation psychologies, and in 2014 was uh, introduced to Freddie Hickling and cultural therapy, which has become a big part of my life and understanding my struggle as a practitioner. Um, what I'm going to talk with you about today is not my work at the university, which I currently do, but my work um, between 2014 and 2016, early 17, in a, a skills training school for adolescent boys, I think 90 to 99 percent of whom came from the inner city. So again, as I said, as uh, someone who leans onto liberation psychologists, it's very important for me um, to set context for you. Um, so this school in particular um, was for boys 16 to 20 years old. I was invited to help establish the school and more specifically function as the director of counseling. Um, so the school was transitioning into more of a skills training school, seeing the needs of a lot of our adolescent youth who after being expelled from or completing high school were really just on the road, to be honest with um, no particular skills, uh, no particular strong educational foundation, and getting caught up, as we know, in a lot of crimes. A lot of crimes in Jamaica are perpetuated by adolescent youth. But what, is a, what was a wider context at that time? Um, so reviewing some of the newspaper articles, I was reminded that in 19, 2014, there was a National Education Inspectorate report. And unfortunately, it found that 61% of um, 129 primary and secondary schools surveyed were found to be ineffective. So let me repeat that again, 61% of primary and secondary schools surveyed in Jamaica were found to be ineffective. And what they meant by ineffective was that the schools lacked leadership, clear mission, quality teaching, and parental involvement. And as we've seen from um, many of the presentations before, parental involvement in this sort of context is very, very important. And I'll get into some of that, um, what I've learned. 
Also in 2014, there was a reconfiguration of um, what was called at the time the Career Advancement Program. So youth who didn't quite make it in the secondary school system often had the opportunity to go into a career advancement program where they would learn skills. And quite a bit of money was pumped into this program. I think I read about sums upward of $800 million. Um, but on reviewing the program, what was found was that 40% of the students who enrolled actually dropped out of the program. The programs were two years. And that after going through two years, upwards of 70% of the students were found to have poor numeracy and literacy skills. So here again, we're seeing lots of money being channeled into programs that did not quite work. Um, and my idea today is not to blame the programs or those who are involved, because I learned, by the way, it is very, very difficult, hence my title, to carry out a program like this, but it's to try to begin to unpack what might be going on. Again, it's from my perspective. Okay, so um, what I found was that the youth who we worked with, and in the first year we had 157 applicants, again, these are adolescent males, and the first thing that we did was that we gave them educational testing. And we found that 78% of the applicants had a very basic level of proficiency in math and English, which means their grade level was between zero to six. So again, these were adolescent males, 16 to 20 years old, some of whom either completed high school or secondary school, but had anywhere between zero to six grade level with numeracy and literacy. We further found that 50% of those, those 157 applicants, at the very basic level, scored within the lowest range measured on the test. So basically, they were illiterate or very barely literate after going through the secondary school system. But we also found, and we've been talking a lot about that today, the idea of traumatogenic environments. And Lynn Layton, who is a psychoanalyst with social leanings, describes traumatogenic environments as individual and group physical, safety, social security, and symbolic capacities are all simultaneously assaulted. And this is what we found as we got to know the boys uh, much better. There's quite a bit of community violence. That's no surprise. We know the murder rates in Jamaica. Um, extensive parental neglect and abuse. Uh, generations of trauma. Um, so for example, I, would, I remember one youth in particular that come, came up for me as I was putting this presentation together. Um, very disruptive behavior in the classroom. And so we started to engage the mother who came in to see me um, as I wanted to talk to her about her son. The mother started telling me about her disciplinary measures, um, some of which were to call her son um, fish, b-boy, all of these things in the hopes that this sort of harsh discipline would get him to act like a man, to stand up strong, but she was doing it through degradation and shaming. But as she started to talk about her history, she just started crying with me. And here was a woman who had a history of multiple sexual assaults, um, living in violent communities. So as we see, there were generations of trauma where often I would start to work with um, the students, but then end up doing quite a bit of work with the parents, which I'm sure um, other presenters know very well, that context. Um, poverty, um, we, that's no surprise to us. Sudden and traumatic loss and grief, this was palpable um, with the boys that we served. Many of them had family members um, dying from violence, friends dying from violence. Um, family members dying very um, suddenly, if you want to call it, from ill health, not being able to afford appropriate health care. And something else that is really very important is poor access to services. Um, a few of our boys, for example, didn't have birth certificates. And so a lot of our work was case management, trying to um, navigate the system to help our boys come up with birth certificates. So you would have very talented boys, for example, in football or art who couldn't really go very far with it because of some of these structural inequities. 
All right, so um, it sets the stage for social and emotional problems. So um, one of the tools that I used um, frequently was the ACEBO. Um, so it is a scale that measures um, social and emotional um, behavioral problems, internalizing and externalizing problems. And I just brought up a, f a few scales um, from that, of course, without any names and so on. So we found, for example, so for those who are not familiar with the scale, whenever you see the line graph going above those dotted lines or within it, it means it's in clinical or subclinical range. And ACEBA is one of the tools that's actually normed on a Jamaican population, which is why we used it. It has Jamaican norms, I should say, not that it is normed, but it has Jamaican norms. And so, for example, we saw youth with aggressive behavior and social and thought problems, depressed youth with frequent somatic complaints. Um, any of you who work in the educational system, I'm sure, work with adolescents who often put their heads on the desks often complain of headaches, needing to go to the bathroom, all of this stuff. So depressed youth with frequent somatic complaints and rule-breaking behavior, for us it was most often substance misuse. And youth with a gamut. As you can, as you can see from um, this one, almost everything is in clinical range here. So for a psychologist to look at, this is quite disturbing, but it's a regular occurrence. So youth with a gamut of internalizing and externalizing problems. So now Freddie Hickling in 2016, as I was going through his book, I took out a quote that I just thought summed up the experience. And it is that the entire society, the Jamaican society, has been plunged into a miasma of problems that can only be likened onto a descent into madness. So here we were at the school grappling with these um, issues that came in to, to us. And one of our goals, um, and I'm quoting Ferry here because it kind of summed it up also very nicely, was that we wanted to know how to convert the rebellious attitudes that we were seeing into revolutionary ones. So we've, we've you know, on the surface, we very much felt that these were adolescent youth with quite a bit of potential, that if harnessed appropriately, they could become citizens of Jamaica who could contribute to change. Okay. And so um, what were some of our interventions? We looked at educational interventions, so the school on a whole, and then I'll go more into some of um, our interventions in the counseling department. Um, skills training, um, so vocational skills training in a few areas. Engaging the youth in sports, something that they were naturally very good at, football being one of them, um, very popular. Um, civics, it was very important to us that youth started talking about some of the things in Jamaica, the history how Jamaica runs, religious education, not as a form of indoctrination, but more or less understanding how religion affects people and their worldviews. Um, and the youth were put in internships in their second year, um, starting in the second year of the program where they had work experience and exposing the youth to areas outside of the inner city, taking them on trips. For us in the counseling department, we tried a gamut of interventions from individual and group counseling, parental meetings, testing, social work, and social welfare. Quite a few of our boys um, spoke to our case manager who had a strong um, background in social work, and they would get free meals, for example, or help with bus fare. Their parents would be um, um, talked to and integrated in the system, and we, saw, we tried to see how we could help the parents. Home visits was also very important, and life skills classes. At the time, I was um, becoming very involved in the Dream World Cultural Therapy Program, so it was very important for me to incorporate some of those concepts into the life skills classes, um, teacher staff training, and consultations to administrators. No. All of this looks wonderful. I must say that um, we were resource limited. And so um, in the counseling department, there was myself, uh, the case manager, and a volunteer guidance counselor. After about a year, we got um, interns. And in the third year, we had two graduate level interns. So um, working with 
150 boys who come in with the miasma of problems, to have that amount of staff is very limiting. So we couldn't quite adequately carry out all that we wanted to carry out. But in the context of all of this, what were some of, uh, what were some of the feedback that we got. So looking through some of the reports and emails sent to me, um, clinicians sometimes would come in to run workshops and deliver reports. I extracted a few quotes. The experience at this school was remarkable um, and it was an educating experience. Somebody said, um, one clinician said to me after speaking with the boys, they said that this is the best they've ever had it in a school environment and one person described it as an oasis. Okay, so the next slide is going to be very interesting to you after I, I gave all of this. I started to review the program, and in year two, this isn't a year one review, I found out that we had up to an 80% dropout rate. So we had an 80% dropout rate from year one to year two. And the dropout rate was due either to uh, students dropping out Sometimes students would come to me and say they can't maintain two years because of the poverty that they lived in and they wanted a job. No, right? And so they couldn't sustain the vision of what might come at the end of two years. Um, unfortunately, we relied heavily, I think, too heavily on suspensions and expulsions, and I'm going to talk about that. And so some of our students were suspended and just never came back because they needed to bring in family. Uh, to talk to parents and um, principals, and some of them did not either have family or they weren't interested in bringing their family in. Um, and some just never showed up in year two. They just never showed up. So despite all of these um, interventions that we wanted to put into place, this was the result initially. No, it's, it was a new program, so I'll reflect on that too. So what do I think was happening? This is actually a young Caribbean scholar, um, Hakeem Williams, and he wrote about his experience in Trinidad, which I think is very much uh, similar to my experience in this um, vocational problem. And he called it a colonial warp, that there are strong forces that despite our best intention will pull us back to the status quo. And for us, the status quo is a colonial mentality. It just is. And so we look at hierarchies. We were very dependent on um, ministries that didn't adequately fund us. And we had to navigate bureaucracy that was often a pain in the, you know where. And so um, also despite um, sometimes teachers' best interests and desire to help our students to become revolutionaries, it was very easy in the face of some of the hostility that can come with attachment problems, hostility that can come with trauma, the disorganization. It is very, very easy to fall back into a hierarchical structure. Instead of sort of maintaining or sitting with some of that chaos, what you tend to do is say, okay, you do this. No, if you don't do this, you'll get punished despite um, your best interests. Um, also, curricula is one of the uh, issues within a colonial warp. Um, we did not get a curriculum for the first two years of the program. There was no curriculum coming forth from the ministry for us. No, I think somebody like Freddie Hickling would say, well, that's actually a good thing. But when you're starting, because you have a lot of freedom to explore and to tap into cultural DNA to teach, but again, when you're beginning, it's often uh, very easy to fall back into traditional modes of thinking. And disciplinary technologies. Again, um, we have a tendency in Jamaica, which was no different in this school, despite our best efforts, again, our best intentions, I should say, to fall back on harsh discipline. So that was seen in the classroom, where the teachers frustrated, overwhelmed, under-resourced, fell very easily on suspensions, and it was also again seen in the families. So um, one thing I vividly remember was a young man who, for all intents and purposes, was very depressed, okay? Um, and I went to speak to his mother at his mother's workplace, which was a primary school, and his mother was a teacher because I wanted to engage her and see what we could do to uh, further engage him in the school. 
And as I was talking to her about her son, she was very frustrated. A child was walking by in the primary school. I don't know what the child was doing, but she turned around from me, grabbed the child, and gave the child about two good slaps. And I just stood there going, okay. Okay, there is harsh discipline meted out in the Jamaican school context um, when there is no intervention. And again, we see this as a legacy of slavery and colonialism that has been generationally passed down to us, that if we don't intentionally break, um, continues to affect us in many ways and create this colonial warp. So um, what are some of the things that came up as I reflected on my practice? Now, it's very important for me to do self-study and self-reflexive work because I think that is um, actually quite ethical. And in my sharing with you and dialogue with you, I, I hope that it um, stimulates action, not only for me and my work, but for, for you and your work. I see I have five minutes. So as I reflected on it, I think for me, it was a lack of understanding of the colonial war. Also, I'm an early career practitioner, so. But it really it was a lack of understanding of um, what some people call the attractors. When a system decides to change or wants to change, there are strong attractors in the environment that will pull the system back into status quo. And I think for me, despite all my love for liberation, psychologies, et cetera, I did not fully understand that. So when it was happening to me in the present, it was very difficult for me to process exactly what was going on. And especially hierarchical relationships, which again, I was pulled into that, well, you can be very good if you're not um, operating from a hierarchical relationship. That is often what is respected, okay? Um, lack of a clear, well-articulated vision for systemic destabilization. So the idea is if you want to break the colonial warp, it has to be systemic destabilization. And I bring to mind a lot of conversations during that period I actually had with um, Prof Hickling and his wife, Dr. Hickling, about how to go about something systemically. You cannot enter environments like this unless you have a systemic clear vision and clear understanding of the forces that are going to pull you back into the status quo. I also think, and um, I tend to have a, also a very large interest in psychoanalysis with social leanings. Um, when you're working with um, young people in general, but young people with complex trauma, you're going to get caught up in, in what we call enactments. Okay, so for you, you're often what we call a good object or a bad object. So there are a lot of bad objects in um, people's social environments. And as Dr. Gusto said, um, you, you automatically sometimes become one of them when you're part and parcel of an institution. Okay, but the thing is when you become um, something different, um, an attachment figure who might be um, caring, gentle, open, listening, um, you will sort of shift from good object to bad object quite a bit. And it, it can be disorienting if you don't reflect on it. And again, the tendency when we shift from good object to bad object is to go back to what you know to, to get on stable grounding. And if you're part of a colonial environment, as I am, what you are used to is a colonial mentality. So you have to be often on guard for that. Um, I won't go through all of them, but another one I will say is um, a lack of understanding of students' community realities. So I entered into this context um, after working for two years in West Kingston. And in that kind of community work, West Kingston in Jamaica, uh, inner city area in Jamaica, for those who are not from Jamaica, quiet, um, violent in a city. And I used to go into people's homes or sit with people in the parks and have conversation, work with youth in a church context and whatever. But even that I don't think adequately prepared me for the educational system and really understanding the social context of students' lives. 
So again, um, the lessons flow naturally from that. Uh, what are some of the lessons? Again, understanding history and context is very, very important. Uh, again, we see that again in the work of psychohistoriography. Um, naming and reflecting on positionality. It's very important to identify where you are in your position in terms of the community and those you work with. Okay, so sometimes I was good object, sometimes I was bad object. Sometimes I was good object to the students. And when I was good object to the students, I might be bad object to the teachers or to the principals. Um, that would often say, Debbie, you're coddling the students too much. Although I have a young man in my office bawling tears um, because of the violence that is meted out to him in his community, but he can't show that face in the school context, okay? So it's very important. And the idea of your positionality as insider and outsider. As a middle-class Jamaican um, woman, um, I was often outsider to a lot of the students' context and the family's context. That isn't a bad thing. Uh, so very briefly, I know I probably only have two minutes left. I remember being in a classroom once, and I was very excited about social change. So Freire says the human vocation um, is hope and the ability to act on your social environment to make a change. When we start to have hopelessness and a belief that we cannot act on our environment to make a change, there's actually a process of dehumanization going on. So we see there, there's lots of dehumanization in society, but hopefully that's changing with our youth. So I was in this classroom, the boys were in a circle, and I was talking about change in the community and how we can liberate ourselves, and one boy was getting very tense and very angry. And when he could not take it anymore, he looked at me and he said, have you screamed? Have you ever seen a man's marrow shot out? What's the answer for me? No. I, I am located in a certain social position in Jamaica that I can live in Jamaica for 40 years and never see a man's marrow shot out. But for this 18-year-old boy, this was a weekly occurrence. No. I could try to escape from that positionality in that moment and say, oh, you know, change the topic. But in that moment, I had to stand very firmly in my positionality. And so I said to him, no. So how is that, that I live 20 minutes from you and I've never seen a man's marrow shot out? At this point, the other boys got extremely excited because you're uptown, miss, because... And so we had a conversation around that. And the circle sort of encouraged that kind of conversation. So the tools were good. It's using them. So if I am not comfortable in my positionality and in my privilege, I cannot have these conversations. Okay? Um, and then the last thing... Um, the last lesson that I reflect on right now is understanding, and this is an understanding that has come gradually for me as a young practitioner, that freedom is a constant struggle. Okay, with the best interventions, it does not come overnight. It is something that takes a long time. And there's actually a, um, a song or a spiritual, an old spiritual that comes with that. And it says, they say freedom is a constant struggle. They say freedom is a constant struggle. They say freedom is a constant struggle. Oh Lord, we've struggled so long. We must be free. We must be free. And I think that points to the dialectic for me, that we are at the same time free and unfree. And that is really important for us to pinpoint that the ways in which we are free and can act on our social environment to create change, to change these rebellious attitudes into revolutionary ones, and then to also recognize that simultaneously we are unfree, okay? And the many ways in which that colonial mentality acts on us to create this unfreedom. So I'm gonna stop there. Wow. Uh, would anybody like to ask a question? <laughs> wow.
One of the exciting things about today is that we have people across generations, and that is a very important part of passing batons and so on, because we're talking about how to undo generational trauma. And um, I think Debian has raised some critical questions that we may want to discuss now, or perhaps after the break. Yes. First, thank you so much. I am uh, uh, tingling. Oh, <laughs> what's your privilege? Tingling with excitement about young minds, fresh view, mm -hmm. um, optimism for future. And you, you struck some. You, you hit upon something that struck me as important for us to all be aware of. And, I, and, and Hillary just reminded me that, that this is about continuing to understand that freedom is a constant struggle. And I think for many of us of a certain generation, we appreciate the history that got us mm -hmm. to this, mm -hmm. and perhaps have not been as good as we should be about sharing that history. But you've been um, yes, supported very uh, much. by people who don't hesitate <laughs> to share. Uh, and I wonder if you could talk just a moment yeah. more about that that whole positionality and, uh -huh. and being comfortable in that position, yeah. even when it is uncomfortable and yeah. you are not as aware, perhaps, of right. all that goes on in that discomfort. Right. Sure. Can you talk a little bit more? Because I'd like to carry that back sure. to some early career people myself. Okay, sure. Um, so two things come up. One is you first comment about the idea of freedom being a constant struggle and having that dialogue. I know Prof Hickling can probably share with you or with that there are many times I was in his office saying, I'm not, I can't do this anymore. I'm going to become maybe, I'm, I'm done with practice. And he would just very calmly look at me and go, no. Or we would have conversations in our um, Karen Mensa team um, and I would learn about the history and ask myself, why don't I know this? Why don't I know this about Jamaica? Um, the idea of positionality and how, how to be comfortable in it, there's always a dis-ease. So you have to be comfortable with dis-ease. And I think dialogue has been a big part of that. So I've had the opportunity to sit with others who point out my privilege and to have dialogue around it. Um, and when I have dialogue with others who are similar to me and different from me, it gives me a knowledge that I can then take into, into my clinical um, situations. I don't know if that answers your question, but the dialogue is really, really important. And opening up what is, um, Lynn Layton calls it a normative silence. We all know, we all know, but we don't talk about it. So it's important to get into spaces where you talk about it. <laughs> 